that way. So who owns them? Nobody. They're not property. They can't be bought. They can't be sold. They can't be traded. They can't be transferred. They can't be attached. And they can't be otherwise provided to anyone other than by policy. They're provided on a non-permanent basis for use. The IRs will provide them to Internet service providers, and the service providers in turn provide them to their consumers. Their consumers may be downstream providers, or they may be uh, home users or corporate users. And they're provided on this non-permanent basis in a manner that's described by you, the community, through a technical and operational policy, which is what the Aaron meeting is about uh, later this week. And even though a lot of people don't believe this, when you're finished using the IP address, it comes back to the registry. Now, being finished using it means when a company is acquired, that IP address is not property. It doesn't transfer to the company that bought it. It has to actually go back to uh, the registry. Or if it's a downstream provider, it could go back to, a, to an internet, internet service provider. So, as a reminder, IP addresses by themselves do not disclose geographical location, who is using it, where it's obtained, or what it was obtained for. Now, some of this information you obviously can derive from directory services such as uh, who is. But uh, looking at an IP address, none of these things can be determined. So, a little bit on history and evolution. Like uh, most everything else with the, uh, uh, with the Internet, it all starts with this guy, John Postel, who, by the way, uh, six years ago yesterday, he uh, passed away. And so if you haven't thought about that, you ought to give it some consideration. John did an awful, awful lot of things for, for the Internet, and uh, I personally have missed him over these last six years. But let's go back to history and evolution. RFC 790, written in 1981, said, if you want an IP address, send an email to John. He'll give it to you. That's exactly how it started, how it worked. The myth about John Postel having a notebook where he wrote stuff down is true. That's exactly the way it started. Of course, very soon, John realized that he had other things to do besides manage handing out IP addresses. And so we had the beginning of the uh, system uh, of IP address management. Now, beginning uh, in the early 80s, the uh, central registry was formed. And this started out at SRI and eventually moved to uh, uh, Network Solutions. And uh, it existed all the way up to uh, 1997. The uh, first regional registry was formed in 1992 as the RIPE NCC, followed shortly thereafter by the APNIC. Aaron was uh, the last major or big registry out of the original set to be formed in uh, 1997. In fact, when Aaron was formed, uh, the central registry ceased operation. Then in uh, 2002, LACNIC evolved as the fourth uh, uh, regional registry, and it uh, evolved out of uh, out of Aaron. The fifth uh, regional registry, uh, which we expect to become operational next year, 2005, is AFRNIC, and is actually now currently being administered by RIPE NCC, APNIC, and Aaron. Uh, one other organization from the IR perspective that's important is that over the years, the IRs have found it necessary to work together to do things, uh, many, many things, and also have found it uh, difficult at times for people to go straight to the IRRs with, with something. For example, the IETF wants to do something, and so it wants to give it to the address registries to do. They didn't have anyone to go to. I mean, they can go to RIPE NCC, and then RIPE NCC shares it, but the delegation went to RIPE NCC. They could have gone to Aaron, same thing, blah, blah, blah. So what uh, we did is that we formed this organization to take care of these kinds of things. And I'll go into this more about the NRO later. And then lastly, that red bar on top uh, indicates the uh, beginning of the desire on the part of the United States government to get out of the Internet uh, management business. And so ICANN was formed in uh, 1999. ICANN is still operating under a memorandum of understanding with uh, the U.S. government, uh, and that expires, I believe, sometime end of 2005. So, if you look at the service regions, the four that are in existence today are Aaron, which is Northern America, portions of the Caribbean, 
Lacnic, which is South America and uh, portions of the Caribbean. Ripe NCC, which is uh, Europe and the uh, former Soviet Union and portions of the uh, Middle East. And APNIC, which is uh, Australia, the remainder of Asia, and Oceania. AFRINIC, which I show as a single service region, actually right now is divided in three pieces. The portion north of the equator is ministered by the RIPE NCC, south of the equator by Aran, and then those islands to the east of, uh, of Africa in the Indian Ocean are uh, uh, administered by APNIC. The little crosses indicate where the uh, headquarters, if you will, of the various regions are. Aran is located uh, very nearby here in Chantilly, Virginia. Lacnic is in Montevideo, Uruguay. RIPE NCC is in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. Uh, APNIC is in Brisbane, Australia. And AFRINIC is now incorporated as an organization in Mauritius, about a thousand miles to the east of Africa. So, a little bit about ICANN, very little. What is it? It's a self-regulatory body is the simplest way to describe it. And what does it do? It's responsible for the top-level technical coordination of the Internet in regards to names, numbers, and root servers. It's not responsible for sell settling a lot of things that people wanted to settle or take care of, so things such as dealing with spam and all kinds of other things, uh, as far as making regulations for privacy issues and uh, getting into real deep involved things in terms of uh, intellectual property and things like that. Things that occupies all of its time, really. But uh, that's what it's really supposed to be doing. What does it look like? It's basically got two uh, sub-organizations. One is uh, a set of supporting organizations, of which there are three. The address supporting organization, the country code name supporting organization, and the generic top-level domain uh, name supporting organization. Then there are a series of uh, committees and task forces, and there are actually a lot more committees than what I show here. These are the ones that are advisory committees to the uh, board, of trust, uh, board of Directors of ICANN. And that's the At-Large Committee, the Government Advisory Committee, the Security Stability Advisory Committee, Root Server System Advisory Committee. And the last one is the uh, Technical Liaison Group, which is really how the uh, ITF uh, interfaces with the ICANN board. And the address supporting organization, what is it? It's really nothing more than an advisory body for global addressing policy. Uh, I will say this, there's very, very little policy that would be global addressing policy. Uh, I was 99.99% eh, somewhere in there. That vicinity of all addressing policy is actually regional in nature. And now it's coincidental that a lot of these policies are very similar and that the various regional registries have the same policies, but they don't, may not have the same flavor of that policy. Uh, everyone has a minimum allocation size. Everyone has a microallocation policy. Uh, everyone has policies on how to deal with uh, transfers and so forth. But these are all regional policies reflecting the regional needs of the ISPs in that region. And what does AS do, ISO do? Well, it, through its address council, it advises the ICANN board on policy matters. And the address council does two other things. It selects two, board, uh, two members of the ICANN board of directors, and it selects one member for the ICANN uh, NOMCOM, Nomination Committee. And it basically looks like this. There's the uh, uh, address council, which I just dis discussed. It's actually composed, and I'll go a little bit more how the address council is formed. And the Secretariat, which really uh, is an operation that's uh, funded and run by uh, every year by one of the IRRs. So, number of resource organization. These are the four CEOs of the IRRs signing the MOU in uh, October last year. In fact, at the last joint Aaron Nanog meeting in Chicago. And why did we do it? Well, we did it because we wanted to formalize our cooperative efforts. And we put the NRO together to do three things. We want to protect the unallocated number resource pool. In other words, that pool of addresses that's being managed by ICANN uh, doing the IANA function. Uh, that is a single point of failure, and uh, there certainly needs to be some mechanism in the event that uh, ICANN can no longer perform that function. I'm not necessarily talking about ICANN going out of business, but it is in Marina del Rey, and they do tend to have earthquakes and things like that there as well. Uh, we wanted to promote and protect the bottom-up policy development process. What we don't want is a body to sit there and dictate to you, the users, 
what is the policy for how you're going to get IP addresses and what you're going to do with them. It's very important that this be an open and democratic process the way it has existed for years and years and years. And so that's another reason why we formed the NRO, to protect that process. And lastly, I kind of alluded to already, which is for the NRO, is acts as that focal point for internet community to input into the IR system. So those are the three things that we formed the NRO to do. So what's it look like? Well, you can see the, uh, yeah, it shows up. the, uh, uh, the uh, registries at the bottom, uh, solid lines for APNIC, Aaron, Ripe, NCC, and LACNIC uh, comprising the current NRO. AFRNIC, uh, when it becomes formally recognized, will join, will sign a joinder to the MOU. The NRO has formed a uh, executive council. The boards of each of the IRRs have uh, identified and appointed to the executive council uh, a member. It right now happens to be the CEOs. And in addition, the CEO of AFRNIC is a permanent member of the executive council as an observer, full rights to do everything except vote. The uh, executive council is advised by uh, two groups, and I'll talk about that in a moment. And uh, we also have a capability of electing a numbers council. And it, it would be composed of three members from each region. Uh, two would be elected at large, and the third one would be appointed by the uh, IRRs. Uh, their boards would determine the process by which they would want to go through to select that person. Now, um, We're getting ready to, in fact, there's something else that, uh, I guess there must be something in the air about Aaron Manog meetings, but uh, this Thursday we'll be signing another MOU, which will be the ASO MOU. And it will, this is an MOU between uh, ICANN and the number resource organization. And basically what it is is the NRO will operate and act as the address supporting organization. The Numbers Council will be transformed and will become the Address Council. And so the Numbers Council will not exist as an NRO organization, but will now exist as the Address Council for the ASO. So the members of the Address Council, who currently are all elected, uh, will then change so that two are elected uh, at large, the third coming from the IRRs. Uh, one of the reasons to do this was is that there was no guarantee in the uh, election, since we're going at large, anyone that has phys is physically located in a region can run to become a member of the address council. And so to make sure that the interests of the IRRs, particularly their members, is met, uh, we decided it would be better suited that if one of those people really was there and knew what was going on. Uh, we have been blessed so far that uh, the Generally, the people that are, uh, have been elected to the address uh, council have an idea of what address ma uh, space management is about, but there's no guarantee that that would happen in the future. So what's the NRO look like? It's got the executive council, which I already talked about, and the numbers council. There's also a secretariat. Uh, now, the executive council has formed uh, two coordination groups, a communications coordination group and an engineering coordination group. The uh, I've already told you the Executive Council has, has uh, appointed members by the boards. I've already described a little bit about what the Numbers Council, how it gets to be there. The Secretariat rotates amongst the IRRs, and uh, we, there's actually a uh, rotation order that exists. Uh, currently, the chair of the Executive Council is uh, a member from uh, APNIC. The uh, Secretary is from RIPE NCC, hence the Secretariat is composed of RIPE NCC staff. The treasurer is from LACNIC, and Aaron this year does not have an officer position, and so we contribute goodwill and a lot of writing efforts. Now, these two groups are composed of the people from the uh, various registries. So, for example, the engineering coordination group is chaired by the chief technical officer from the RIPE NCC, since that's where the secretariat resides. Then each IRR has appointed uh, senior engineers to this group. This allows the IRRs, to, uh, the, the group, to coordinate and do joint activities. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Similarly, the coordination group is chaired by the senior communications officer or a person from the RIPE NCC, and the communications type people from the other registries are participating in that. So what does the NRO do? Activities. Well, first of all, the NRO supports ICANN. 
I've already described the Secretariat staffing, and uh, I don't know exactly how many people that Brighton CC is using uh, to do this function, but we're talking about running websites, we're talking about running mail lists, uh, we're talking about a number of things. The NRO contributes uh, annually to the ICANN budget. Uh, actually, to tell you the truth, that money right now is sitting in escrow. Uh, about half of it is. The other half we have over time provided to ICANN as signs of good faith that eventually we would sign an address supporting organization, MOU. And uh, who knows, this Thursday ICANN may get some more of that money. <coughs> but we also totally fund all the activities of the address supporting organization. None of the money that is needed to operate the address supporting organization comes from the ICANN budget. None at all. And we also provide uh, travel for the members of the address council. Uh, it's a general rule that members of the address council will attend the regional uh, public policy meetings for the region in which they were elected. In addition, the chair has to attend every ICANN meeting and we also provide funding for the entire address council to meet face to face twice a year. The outreach activities are uh, done by the uh, communications coordination group preparing presentations and uh, to be used uh, meetings with government representatives and industry groups, uh, run the website like I've already said, and also to put out information in the form of press releases and so forth. The uh, engineering coordination group is uh, takes care of things such as the joint administration of the reverse DNS. Also, we're working on a couple of directory service activities. One is to put together a joint who is and the other is uh, active participation in the CRISP working group of the ITF. And here's a sample page of the uh, uh, NRL website. It uh, was designed by the RIPE NCC. It's actually a very nice looking uh, website. So, and uh, <coughs> next year it will be maintained by APNEC. I don't think it will change as far as the, uh, the presentation and appearance, but uh, it, it's... Uh, got everything it's got a lot of things that if you haven't been there you should go there because it's got a lot of background information a lot of documentation and uh, the copies of the uh, MOU that formed the NRO and plus uh, the uh, document that's going to form the ASO so I'm going to talk a little bit now about the World Summit on the Information Society and since I finished this I am done with high-level politics uh, governments for considerable period of time have been involved in trying to figure out what to do about the internet and as the US government tries to get out of it there are other governments that are trying to get into it and uh, so out of this concern arose a uh, uh, an idea that, that there should be a world summit on the information society and as a result of that, through the years 2002 and culminating in December of 2003 in Geneva at the, at the first summit meeting, two documents were produced, a Declaration of Principles and a Plan of Action. And the Declaration of Principles is just that. It is a, actually it's a pretty long document that describes the principles by which the summit believes the internet should be uh, operated and governed. And the plan of action is the means that they're proposing on how to get there. Now, nothing has really happened with either of these two documents because we're actually now going into a phase two. Now, the ITU is the one that uh, basically sponsored the phase one of the WISIS. It's now been turned over to the uh, United Nations, and the Secretary General has uh, formed what is called the Working Group on Internet Governance. So, to your acronym bag, you now have WISIS and WIGIG. And the uh, working group uh, recently, about uh, three weeks ago, had a, conducted a consultation in Geneva to figure out what it's going to do and to figure out who gets to be in the working group. Now, I attended that, and uh, I guarantee you it's a lot of governments wanting to do a lot of things, and everyone has all the little pet things that they want to see done. So it's, it's, it's a lot of complicated things going on. So that uh, layer nine is really getting worked over real hard here. And the outcome is as expected in 2005 to have another summit in Tunis at the end of 2005. And so uh, between now and then, uh, 
uh, there will be uh, several prep comps, and actually the first one was held uh, earlier this year. This next one is going to be in February, and the last one is scheduled to be uh, in July. And where we go from there, it's anybody's guess. So, what's the plan? I'm not going to go through this. Uh, when you get to the web, when I get this thing converted to a PDF file, finally you'll be able to see this up on the website. I recommend that you do go, to, and I'll later on show you the uh, URL for this website to go look at this, spend some time reading it. I know the tendency of most people in this room is to say, ah, oh, it's politics, it has nothing to do with me. Well, believe me, it does have a lot to do with you because this is going to influence the way you do business five and ten years from now. And uh, this is the thing that could cause a uh, regulatory body to be created that's going to sit there and make regulatory decisions about how you do your business. So it really behooves you to pay attention to what's going on now and to make your voice known. The, uh, each of the IRRs is individually accredited to the uh, WISIS process, and the NRO itself is also accredited to the WISIS process. So you do have a voice that can be get into the doors and, and have meetings. Unlike an ANOG meeting or a uh, regional registry public policy meeting where the door is wide open, anyone can come in and walk with the mic and say something, this doesn't work that way. You've got to be invited. And if you're invited, you have to have the right color of invitation to be able to really get up and say something. And so uh, I encourage you very much so to, uh, to check this out and then pay attention to it. So having said all that, what's an IRR look like? Well, it's a not-for-profit organization. And uh, we don't charge for IP addresses. You may think so, but we don't. We're charging for services, and I'll detail these services in a while. And we also have open financial reporting. And if you're at uh, the meeting on Friday, the treasurer of Aaron will get up and give a financial report. The budgets are available on the website. The, the past years are archived. You can go look and see how the money was spent. Membership, it's open to anyone who wants to get in. And if you become a member of Aaron and not receive any services at all, $500. But it doesn't guarantee you if you pay $500 that you're going to get that slash 32 that you want to be six base. It says that you, what you can do, which is probably more important from some perspectives, is that you can nominate and vote for members of the Aaron Board of Trustees and for the Aaron Advisory Council, the real governance uh, bodies inside the Aaron region. And literally right now, there's thousands of ISPs, uh, other companies, end user companies, and stakeholders who are members of the Aaron region. Uh, later on this week at the Aaron meeting, uh, Susan Hamlin, the Director of Member Services, will throw up a slide that's got the statistics of the distribution of members in the Aaron region. So I would hope you're here to uh, see that. And lastly, as I've been harping on a little bit here, it's industry regulated. Uh, and it's regulated from the perspective that the executive board of any IRR is elected. And it's industry regulated in that members approve activities. Now what does that mean? Do you sit there and vote on every time that I tell a Leslie to go do something? I don't think so. What that really means is that you're the ones that create the policy. I don't make policy. The Aaron board doesn't make policy. Aaron staff doesn't make policy. And if you ever think we are, please let me know because I will find out where the problem is. We don't make policy. We only execute it. We do what you tell us to do. Nothing more, nothing less. So those are the activities that you approve of. You're the one that also decides whether or not we should engage in some type of an activity. Uh, for example, uh, about a year or so ago, there was some question that was being discussed about whether or not the IRR should be hold the key signing key for DNSSEC, for the root. And uh, we discussed that in, on a mail list and also in a public policy meeting. I can't remember when it was a couple years ago. But in the end, the people in the Aaron region said, no, that's not a good thing for Aaron to do. That's not in what we want you to do. So we politely declined that invitation to do so. I will state that the same thing also happened in the other registries as well. But that's how members approve activities. And actually, that's how stakeholders approve the activities, if anyone is interested. So, services. What kind of services do we have? They're basically in three quarter, uh, categories. 
registry services, organizational services, and policy development facilitation. Big words. Okay, registry, these are the things that you're most familiar with. Allocation of IP addresses, allocation of uh, autonomous system numbers, running directory services such as who is and the internet routing registry, and also running the reverse DNS. Organizational, these are things that are required for the organization to function. So we conduct elections. I'll be talking about elections shortly. Uh, we conduct meetings, and uh, we're having a meeting later this week. In fact, uh, we've been working very closely with ANOG to have this meeting, our third meeting, which looks to be a very, very successful one, more successful than the last two. Organizationally, we provide information. Uh, put out a website, and uh, every IR has a website, and uh, every IRR has a newsletter in some form or other. And lastly, uh, all the IRRs conduct training. So those are organizational activities that take place. Now, I said we don't make policy, but you couldn't make policy if you didn't have the tools to do so. And so the other services that the IR performs are those that will help you make policy. So maintaining the discussion list, the email list, archiving those things, uh, conducting the policy meetings. In other words, going out and engaging a, uh, a venue and uh, coordinating to make sure you got uh, internet service and uh, get uh, snacks in the morning and the afternoon and meals and and just so you can kick back and relax a social event but all those things are part of a meeting and make a meeting uh, a, an important thing to go to and also make it a little bit enjoyable it gives you a chance to network with your people that you normally wouldn't see on a day-to-day -day basis and lastly to facilitate uh, policy development the IR has published the policy documents these include two uh, forms of documents. One is the actual policy itself, and the second is a procedural document that says, here's how the policy is, is implemented. Now, in some cases, it's an actual procedural guide. In other cases, it's probably just detailed instructions on a, on a template. And here is the House of IP Address Management. And IP Address Management is done in two areas, one through policy and the other through administration. There are objectives to create the policies and there are principles on how administration is conducted. Policy objectives, objectives we have to make sure that are, are adhered to and the members make sure they're adhered to. We're worried about conservation, aggregation, and uniqueness of IP addresses. And under principles, the principles about the way that Aaron deals with a, a, the, uh, the, the, the community is that we are impartial, we are neutral, and we are consistent. And the one thing that kind of supports both of them is both an objective from a policy and it's also an, uh, a principle of administration is that we're fair. And if at any point in time, when it comes to administration of IP addresses, if you don't think that we're being fair, consistent, neutral, and partial, I want you to personally send me an email and I will personally deal with it. It's up to you to make sure that the uh, uniqueness, fairness, aggregation, and conservation are taken care of in policy. I don't make policy, you do. So, how's it made? Well, there's some principles that we look at when we do it. One is it's inclusive. Anyone can participate in the discussion. I mean literally anyone. And you don't even have to be in the Aaron region to be involved in making policy in, in the Aaron region. You can comment from wherever you are in the world. And conversely, if you're in the Aaron region and Ripe NCC on their policy list are discussing a policy, you're more than welcome to chime in and say something there. Same thing is true of APNIC and LACNIC. It's transparent. All the minutes of all the meetings are published. And they're published in short order after the meeting occurs. All the mail lists are archived. And if you want to see what a policy discussion was in the Aaron region five years ago, you can go to the Aaron website and if you really like looking through email archives, I imagine there are some people that really do, uh, you can see what happened. Uh, it's also uh, <clears throat> transparent from the perspective that there are no closed sessions. All the email lists are open to anyone who wants to subscribe. Public policy meetings are open to anyone who wants to come to them. All policies and procedural uh, documents are documented. That's that's, there's no secret hidden handshake deals that are made in regards to policies, no hit secret handshakes and so forth about uh, the way things are done. And uh, 
when you uh, go to Aaron and you apply for address space today and you talk to one of the IP analysts and two weeks from now you go and you talk to Aaron again you talk to another IP analyst you'll be treated exactly the same way using the same procedures because those procedures are documented and you have the opportunity to look at them and see what it is. And lastly, policy uh, development principle is bottom up. It's done by the community. It's done up. In other words, anyone in this room, if they wanted to right now, if you get on the public policy list and say, hey, I think Aaron should do this. And then a discussion would start. So there is a cycle to this, though. And first one is what I kind of alluded to already, which is a need has to be identified. Now, there's several different ways that needs get to be identified. One is by a change of technology. Another one is by a change in the industry. Uh, those are two most common ones. It's then discussed. It's discussed in uh, the uh, mail list, and also it's then discussed in public policy meetings. And then uh, consensus is determined. And the executive boards of the various IRs are the final arbiters on whether or not consensus was reached. And then it's implemented. And it's implemented not only by the uh, registry staff, but also by the service providers in that region. And then lastly, that policy is evaluated. It's evaluated both by the staff, and it's also evaluated by the community. Is it doing what we thought it was going to do? Is there an unintended consequence that when we put this policy together that we didn't expect to happen, and now it's happening. And lastly, has something changed that uh, wasn't uh, apparent before? Which then, of course, will bring you back around the circle to the need. So that is really it as far as all the governance issues, policy development, and how things are done. But for those of you who think that I'm ready to say goodbye, not quite yet. First of all, I want to run through and show you what the uh, status of the Internet number resources are as of the uh, 30th of September uh, of this year. Uh, these statistics are gathered by all the IRRs and are routinely put together in a presentation. IPv4 address space status. On the right, you see the uh, IANA reserve, which is currently 94 slash 8. And you see not available space, uh, the multicast, the private use, and uh, the private data network. And over on the left, you see the allocated space. Who allocated it? You see about 94 of those were allocated by the central registry. Remember that central registry went out of business in 1997. So from 1981 to 1997, 94 slash 8s were allocated. And beginning in 1992 is when the IRR started allocating address space. And you see not a lot of it has been allocated by the uh, slash eights have been allocated by the uh, registries. Now, this indicates two things. One is, is that that uh, central registry space represents a lot of legacy class A space, where you have uh, some of the guys that first came in the door and said, I need, IP, I need an address, and said, okay, here, have net six. It's all yours. Oh, you can have... 23. And so you've got literally hollow amounts of address space sitting out there in those in those old class A's. Uh, the second thing it represents is, is it's interesting to note is that the uh, conservation principle being practiced by the IRs, uh, that space is very compacted. There's very little waste in that uh, space that's been allocated by the IRs. And what that makes that even more significant is is that most, if not all, that occurred during the dot-com boom when everybody was getting an IP address to start the uh, ISP in their basement. And so uh, there's probably more users, if you will, connected to the space that's been handed out by the IRs as opposed to the space that was handed out by the uh, central registry. Uh, allocations from the IRs, the uh, LIRs, local internet registries, as a call in some of the other regions, or the ISPs as a call in the urban region. Yearly comparison, you can see that uh, bars 99 through 2004 September, and the color codes are uh, the various registries. Now, while the numbers may vary from region to region, if you look, uh, the curves basically follow the same shape. You can do some connecting the dots of the various registries, which I think is an interesting phenomenon. And if you make that into a big pie and look at the cumulative total to date, you see that uh, between Aaron, Ripens, EC, and APNIC, they each have approximately a third of the space 
LACNIC being a smaller registry has uh, only 2% of the space. And looking at autonomous system numbers from the IRs to the uh, ISP LIRs, yearly consumption, Aaron by far and large, uh, in a way, uh, uses a heck of a lot more AS numbers. And probably that's because multi-homing is a big feature in the Aaron region. It's not practiced as much in the other regions. And if you look at it from a cumulative total perspective, Aaron has allocated over half of the uh, ASN numbers. Now, damn, didn't show up right. Anyway, the uh, all allocations of uh, IPv6 to the IRRs is number of slash 23s. Uh, the big bars that are farthest to the right is uh, RIPE and CC. They've got uh, 23 slash 23s from the IANA. The SNCC one over, the smallest one is from LACNIC. They've got one. <laughs> the uh, Aaron region has uh, three, and the APNIC region has four. So by and away, right now, the most uh, IANA has given the most IPv6 space to the RIPE and CC. And if you look at it from a perspective of allocations from PI, you see percentage-wise that uh, the, this 58 percent of it uh, is it was a ripe and CC, and we can't see this either. 32s. These these are allocations uh, that have been made by the registries, and uh, the biggest chunk over to the right, uh, ripe and CC has given out the equivalent of 5,027 uh, slash 32s. Uh, Lacnic uh, moving to the left is 10. Uh, Aaron uh, 107 and three quarters, and AP Nick 177 and a half. Uh, what we're doing there is we're also counting micro allocations, and uh, Aaron has had a lot of uh, micro allocations of V6 space to support that infrastructure. And if you look at it from the IRs to the ISPs, LIRs, you can see the curve, and you can see those big, large yellow bars jumping up in 2002, 3, and 4 in the uh, RIPE NCC region, which causes some people will say, well, gee, we have a foot race going on, and right now the Europeans are winning. Now, I don't think there's necessarily a foot race here as much as there's business decisions being made. And if you look at it from a cum total, RIPE and CC is handed out about 57% of the space. And if you look at it by economies or countries, the U.S. has 94 allocations of IPv6 space. So while the Aaron region has a relatively small amount, if you start stacking countries together, looking at it from a country perspective, the U.S. is the largest. And the Japanese, who have a national policy about IP6, their deployment are second and so forth. Personally, I don't like this slide because I don't think we should be in the business of rank ordering here. I think we should be in the business of using it to the best common good. But uh, there are some people that like to see these things, so it's up there. And. I talked a little bit about uh, Africa and uh, what's uh, becoming another registry. And uh, from the perspective of the ad address space that's been allocated and administered by APNIC, RIPE, NCC, and Aaron, you can see V4 space that 81% of it has come from Aaron uh, for V4. And uh, in uh, AS numbers, Aaron has allocated 64% of the uh, AS numbers in Africa, almost 65. And uh, in V6 space, there have been six allocations, one by the RIPE NCC and five by uh, Aaron. And if you really want to do things with these things, the IRs on a daily basis update their registration statistics. And you can go to those uh, websites where it says IR stats and uh, download these things. They're in a uh, file format that you can take and you can spin it into whatever little analysis tool you want to come up with. and win the Nobel Prize for deciding when we're going to run out of E4 space or so forth, it's have at it. Uh, there's also stats available uh, at the ICANN and IANA organization sites uh, in terms of uh, flat files that have got some statistics on the uh, large allocations from uh, the uh, IANA function to uh, the uh, registries. So let's look at this week, let's look at some errand services and activities as well. So first of all, I'm going to go through real quickly uh, a quick policy review of the policies that are in existence in uh, the Aaron region. Uh, the single home policy for ISPs, uh, minimum allocation size slash 20, you got to demonstrate that you can use it. 
80% utilization to get more of it, and uh, you've got to report your reassignment information back to Aaron, either via SWIP or through the R who is uh, servers, and you've got to provide utilization information. And you can get, if you can demonstrate an immediate need, you don't have to do a lot of other things, but you can get a slash 20 very quickly. So if that windfall opportunity arises that you have now got this business opportunity and you're going to sell an IP service to these huge developments that are going all over Northern Virginia, bingo, you can get it. Single home policy for end users, again, it's a slash 20. You gotta just demonstrate an immediate need of 25%. Now we're talking about large corporations or universities that wanna get space. Although one could arguably say these people are service providers too. However, I'm not gonna get into discussion about what is an ISP, because every time that happens, it's a big rat hole. And you have to demonstrate a one-year projected need of 50%. Multi-home policy in the urine region, uh, slash 22. It's the minimum size, it applies to both in internet service providers and end users, and you have to demonstrate utilization of a 23, and you have to renumber. V6 policy review, and currently the policy is minimum size is slash 32. There is no maximum allocation size. So if you wanna come in and ask for a slash 16 worth of IPv6 space, and you can justify it, you will get it. Criteria, not an insight. You got a plan, and there's a key word here, plan to provide. A lot of people say, well, I can't get IPv6 space because I don't have 200 customers. Well, you got a plan to provide it. And currently you have plan to provide it to five to 200 end sites, 200 users in five years. And it also counts your infrastructure as well. So if you're gonna have uh, separate multiple data centers uh, across the region and you're going to do other things where you're going to consume the address space. You know, you've got five years to chew up 200 of these things. That's not a lot. I mean, actually, if you have a business, you only got 200 customers. It's a very small business. So it's, it's not that hard to get it to justify it from the perspective because it is a plan. And you got a plan to provide IPv6 connectivity. And that's almost like a hello, you know. If you want IPv6 space, I would presume you want to provide IPv6 uh, connectivity. So. Microallocation policy, each uh, IR has one. It's designed to uh, provide infrastructure uh, addresses for public exchange points, uh, what the community thinks are uh, critical internet infrastructure networks, and applies to both V4 and V6. AS numbers, uh, you have to have a unique routing policy, and uh, multi-home site is the other uh, AS number, reason to get an AS number. Transfers. Now remember way back, I said that you can't transfer numbers. Well, you really can't. What really happens, if you were to legally look at what occurs, is that the IP address space goes from, let's say company A buys company B. Well, what happens is, is that company A says, okay, company B, I just bought you and I now own your customer list and I now own all your equipment and so forth. And this equipment right now has got uh, IP addresses on it. And sorry, those IP addresses don't go with the machines. They go back to, the, to, to, to Aaron. But what you really do is you say, hey, dear Aaron, I would like to use these same addresses if I could. So there's a transfer policy that takes into account that this, how this is gonna happen. Because what you have to do is you come back to Aaron and say, I now have got all this equipment and all these customers. Here's my justification for the address space. So please issue me this address space. And because the community said, well, let's make it easier so people don't have to renumber. Aaron, what you do is that you say to the guy, okay, here's your address space, and you give it back to him, the same set of numbers, so he doesn't have to renumber. But legally, what has happened is that number has gone from company B to Aaron back to company A. So. Although the term transfer is used, it's actually a return and a justification for new space. And of course, you gotta provide legal justification and uh, we have to verify that you're gonna utilize them the way you say we're going to. It's not a hard process. Some additional services that are provided, uh, some of these are repetitive from what I talk, talked about earlier with IRs in general do. Uh, we also, and there will be a, I'll go into a little bit, 
a, uh, a tutorial later on this week about uh, cryptographic authentication. Uh, we've got documentation on our website, additional documentation. Uh, we now have v6 services uh, for DNS, FTP, HTTP, and Whois via port 80. Uh, you can get bulk copies of Aaron Whois by filling out an AUP, and uh, you get that uh, via FTP. And our Whois is still alive and well. And we provide, uh, actually Aaron is the one that produces the Internet or the ARPA file for, uh, for ICANN. It's not done there, it's done uh, where we are. So, for example, when APNIC gets a new allocation of, uh, of V4 space, we are the ones that have to change the Internet or the ARPA file. And that's just a holdover from the days of the central registry. Some active projects that we're engaged in uh, with the other registries, DNSSEC uh, for reverse uh, DNS. Uh, I mentioned earlier we're actively involved in the CRISP working group and our engineers are working on near term before CRISP gets out the door to put up some sort of a, a joint who is. And ERX stands for the Early Registration Exchange Project. If you recall, I said the central registry went away. Well, the central registry allocated a whole lot of space. And a lot of that space was also in the Ripen CC region and the APNIC region. Well, the people in those regions, if they wanted to make a DNS change, had to go to Aaron to make the DNS change, even though the registration record was in another registry. So it was kind of cumbersome. So beginning about four years ago, we said, well, let's change that. Let's make it so the ISP only has to go to one place. And so we have been moving these things, uh, records around, one slash eight at a time, and uh, we are just about done. We are now into doing this with the records in the swamp. So it's been a long and painful process because there's a lot of notifications that have got to occur and so forth, but we're almost finished. So I think that is probably one thing that you could always point to and say, this is how well the IRs can work together for the good of the Internet. And it's this project right there. So Cross-registry uh, was it Internet or Information Service Protocol, something like that. It's 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 kind of like Whois, but it's not a replacement for Whois. It's a directory service. Uh, there are several uh, Internet drafts that are available if you go to the ITF site and look at that working group. Uh, it primarily started out in the names world, and uh, from the addressing perspective. Uh, we were asked uh, would we participate, and we thought about it and said, well, do we really want to get involved with the names people? And we said, well, no, we don't want to get involved with the names people, but we do think we need to participate because uh, we've got to make sure that something doesn't get implemented that could have an impact on us. So there are separate drafts or portions of drafts that deal with uh, strictly uh, the uh, directory service aspect from an addressing perspective. Uh, policy development, a little bit more on this. Uh, basically, we do it the same way everybody else does it, open forums. And uh, if you're one of the, I believe, 140 people that's registered for, bo for both meetings, and this is your first time to an area meeting, welcome. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it, and I look forward to your participation. Uh, our policy development is just responsive. What you want is what you get. And sometimes you've got to be careful what you wish for. Uh, Technical challenges in policy development, there's always a technical challenge. So there there's, could easily be two or three competing technologies about how to do something. And so that argument will ensue inside the room. Now, Aaron has a very well documented internet resource policy evaluation process. It's at uh, that URL right there. And in fact, uh, I believe we have copies available in our meeting handout packets as well. So if you are registered for the uh, Aaron meeting, in your, pa in your handout, your packet, there is a copy of that process. And uh, if you think that a policy has been moved through the process without following what's documented in this process, I, you must, and I'll say must, or you either contact me or you contact the chairman of uh, the Aaron Board of Trustees, uh, John Kern. And between us, we'll, we'll see what, what, what really happened here and give you an answer because it's very important to us that we follow this process. So, some milestones. Going back to those little things we talked about before, need. 
Okay. In the urine policy process, uh, you got to submit it at least 60 days prior to an open policy meeting. And the advisory council of Aaron goes through and does an initial review and uh, begins a discussion of it. And there's then a formal proposal posting 30 days prior to the public policy meeting. Now, the Aaron advisory council may think, may after an initial review, come back and say, gee, there's already a policy that covers this proposal, and we'll say this shouldn't go forward, and we'll say so. Or they'll say that actually there's already a policy that deals with this, but this is a change to it, so maybe uh, the author might want to consider changing the current policy or getting rid of the old one to implement the new one. So there may be some other things that have to be done. The language may not be clear or uh, maybe some convoluted logic there. But So uh, the AC may decide, well, we need to work with the uh, author of the policy. Or they may say, hey, let's let it go and see what happens. But anyway, uh, 30 days prior to the meeting is the formal proposal uh, posting and uh, numbers given to the policy proposal and so forth. Then at the open policy meeting, there's a discussion. Now, up to this point, there's been discussion on the mail list. And so now we have a face-to-face -face discussion in the policy meeting. And it'll be Thursday or Wednesday and Thursday of this week. Then, based upon the discussions on the uh, email list and on uh, what occurred on the open policy meeting, the Aaron AC will meet uh, this week, in fact, Thursday night after the conclusion of the two-day public policy meeting and do an appraisal about what they if they think there's consensus reached and uh, to assist in this and in fact it happens at the public policy meeting uh, Aaron staff uh, provides a summary of the discussion of the email list in other words how many posts were made to the list by how many people and what were the general threads so it makes it a little bit easier for you to look at it yourself and see what's happened that that's presented at the public policy meeting uh, this is also provided on a routine basis uh, over time to the uh, Aaron Advisory Council. So anyway, they appraise it, and if they think that there's consensus that this thing should move forward, they issue a last call for an additional 10 days, working days. And this is the last chance for people to say things, much similar to the way an ITF last call works. And then they can have a meeting, it's uh, generally a telephonic meeting, to, to review the results of the last call. And if after all this, they feel that there's consensus that this should move forward, they send it to the Aaron Board of Trustees for ratification. Now the board is not ratifying the policy. The board is looking at and making sure that the process was followed. And that the other thing they're looking at is to make sure that there's nothing there that's gonna be damaging to the members. In other words, we don't want a policy that's going to cause Aaron to get sued, and therefore, there's where all your membership fees went and went to the pockets of the uh, Aaron General Counsel. Now, that's, that's, they have a fiduciary responsibility. And also, they are going to look to determine and see to make sure that everybody was that they could think of or should have been consulted on this process was, was consulted. And... Uh, if all those things uh, pass muster, then they say, here it is, the Aaron staff gets it, and the Aaron staff puts it in the process. Again, that's the URL for the policy process, and uh, like I said, it will be available as a handout uh, later this week. So if you haven't read this, go ahead and read it. And for those of you that like flowcharts, there is a real nice, complicated flowchart to go with this. You can spend hours going through it, making sure that there are no... Uh, loops that will you, that you can't escape from and so forth. So it's a, a fun game in the bar after about five beers. So, now, we've added a few things to this. Uh, first of all, remember I said way back that uh, the AC is going to look at things? Well, if the AC said, nah, we don't like this thing because it already exists, and so why should it be coming discussed again? The policy already exists or... Uh, they said, well, we, uh, we really want to work with the author in this. The author says, well, screw you. I'm not going to work with you. So the AC doesn't recommend that it goes forward. So the author can petition. And all the author has to do is find four people four organ from four different organizations and that says, yes, we think this policy should be discussed. And there is a process to do that, and it goes out on a public list, call for people to participate, 
and the petition period is open for a period of time. And if four people say yes, then it goes forward and gets discussed. Now, after the last call, when the AC does their appraisal, and they say, well, we really don't think that this thing met the last call review, or we don't really think there was consensus reached to the meeting and the mail list, the author of the policy can say, well, I really disagree with you, and they can petition again. Now, the uh, hurdle is a little higher here. Now you've got to find 10 people from 10 different organizations to agree with you to get this thing back into discussion. So if you can successfully petition, the, process, the policy stays there. So what that does, it says that the AC can't be arbitrary and say, well, I don't like John because he's the one, since I don't like John, I don't like his policy proposal. And uh, so there has been, uh, I don't know, how many petitions? One? Two? One of, one of each of them. And uh, I can't recall the outcomes. Okay, one succeeded, and the last call one did not. Okay, so it works both ways. Now, the Board of Trustees has got a couple things it can do. One is, let's say that something happens. Well, the Board of Trustees can suspend this process. There's a short process that can be used, and the Board of Trustees says there's an emergency, and we have to have a policy to deal with something right now. So there is a, a provision to get this thing done in, in, a, in a period done in a, sh a shorter period of time. Also, remember I said that the, uh, that the board is kind of concerned about making sure everyone's voice was heard? Well, they have the capability also of suspending a policy. A uh, good example is the, is the uh, virtual web hosting policy of uh, year 2000, somewhere in there, 2000, yeah. Yeah, it was, two, it was 2000, 2001. And uh, a policy was passed in 2000 which basically uh, dealt with virtual web hosting. Well, there were a bunch of guys that didn't participate in this discussion because they really didn't pay attention to what's going on, and these were the guys that running web services. And so they started coming to Aaron to get single IP addresses for each one of their web servers, and Aaron said, gee, no, you don't get that because this policy says you can do virtual web hosting. He said, well, no, we can't. And so the board suspended the policy in uh, September of 2000 and said, okay, this thing needs to be discussed more. Now, notice I said suspend. They didn't disapprove it. They didn't cancel it. They suspended its implementation. It went back out for discussion. And so the following uh, April at the San Francisco meeting, after having gone through mail discussion and also through another policy discussion, the policy was implemented, but it was modified to work for the uh, people that, it, that had objected to it. So that's a good example of how a uh, group can be listened to. So I will also use this right now and say, you better pay attention to what's going on in WISIS because you could be those web hosters if you're not careful. So some recent things we've added to this process in uh, the next iteration of the document. There's now a mandatory requirement for the Aaron General Counsel to review every single policy proposal beforehand to make sure that there is uh, uh, a determination that uh, you need to see where there may be a, a problem. And also, Aaron's staff is now required to provide an implementation analysis. Uh, you don't want one of the unintended consequences of implementing a policy is for me to go out and hire 20 more people. It's going to cost money. Or you don't want me to have to build a new equipment room to put in 10,000 servers to deal with this uh, thing that you thought would be a nice thing to have. So that becomes part of the discussion set. And uh, at the meeting later this week, you will see the results of those things and the policies that are currently under discussion. Lastly, uh, well, almost lastly, policy manual. Uh, if you are a frequent user of the Aaron website, you know the Aaron policies are kind of like said this way and said that way, and some of them got numbers and some of them don't have numbers, and uh, they're kind of hard to follow around, and you say, gee, those guys are really doing a good job of making sure I don't understand what's happening here. And so maybe they should get a uh, pay raise for that. But anyway. <laughs> Yeah, we, we saw that too. The board said, hey, this has got to be fixed. So earlier this year, uh, the board said, fix it. So Aaron's staff uh, was given the task of taking all those policies, if you will, and collating and, and organizing them into a single uh, document, if you will. And so there's a simple, uh, single manual. 
And so it now makes it easier for you to reference back and forth and find things. And uh, it also helps to protect the integrity of the, of the documentation itself. Now, just to make sure that you didn't change a policy when we sat here and did some editorial work on it, or we didn't write a new one, the advisory council was involved as well. And their job was to do, first of all, review of the proposed structure of the document. And they did that and said, okay, this looks like a good structure, and that's what they recommended to the board, that the, the manual should follow the structure. Then, as we went through and made all those changes, the uh, next thing that happened was is that the advisory council, there's 15 of them, by the way, they broke into small teams and they each took portions of the manual, and they went through and made sure that there were no changes to the policies as they were stated and then restated. So lastly, uh, they met and they uh, made that determination and they uh, recommended that the Board of Trustees adopt this. And so the Board of Trustees, as they're meeting on the uh, 29th of September, uh, said, yay, verily, this is now the policy document. Now, all those other things that uh, had been the policy document, they've all been archived. So they still exist. And if you want to go back and check for yourself, and I encourage you to do so, if you have any doubts, just go back and look. And if you think that in that editorial transition process some change occurred, please bring it to my attention. And last Friday we published that, and it is available also in your meeting packet. Uh, you know, I sit here in staff here, uh, I actually would like to single out one person that actually did the bulk of the work on this, and that's Einar Bull, and Einar, raise your hand. He did an awful lot of work on this. Suffered a lot of grief from me in the process, but he did a good job. So. Thank you, Susan. Uh, the active policy proposals, uh, this, this, for this meeting, there are four of them. They are available uh, for discussion if you want to look at them uh, at those URLs. Our meeting, this is our third meeting back to back with NANOG. And uh, every time, every year, it gets bigger and better. And our public policy meeting is Wednesday and Thursday this week. And again, reminder Thursday morning will be also the signing of the ASO MOU. And our members' meeting will be on Friday. Uh, if you haven't registered already, you can register on site. And it's already too late to register today because that closed at 4, but you've got all day tomorrow. Well, actually, only 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. tomorrow. Hmm. And then Tuesday from 3 to 7. Although, I'm sure if you missed those times and you want to register for the meeting, I'll take care of it for you, okay? Some outreach activities uh, from the standpoint of training education. We're again running our registration help desk. Uh, there'll be hours when it's open. However, if you want to schedule a private appointment with uh, the uh, registration staff, uh, there is an email address where you can send uh, information to. In addition, uh, Leslie, raise your hand. Director of Registration Services is right there, so you can all gang up on her right now if you want to. She's shaking her head, but don't believe it. And uh, her, she has uh, staff here that, in addition to manning the help desk, would be glad to meet with you privately if you have something you want to discuss. And we've got some uh, standardized registration training programs that are available online. And uh, we are doing some activities with our news agencies, and we also are doing our out outreach activities with people like the uh, GSM North America Association. And believe it or not, from time to time, the phone rings and someone in the U.S. government asks me a question. So I do provide them with information from time to time as far as here's how things really are working. Now, whether or not it goes anywhere, I don't know. This is an election year, so they're probably looking for something anyway. We do have on-demand training, uh, registration process flowcharts. Uh, this enables you to follow through a flowchart and actually complete a template. And so you don't need to go to a special class someplace where you have to pay travel. You can go online and do it anytime you want to. And uh, we also have a couple uh, computer-based training courses, one on the air, air and database and templates, another one on how to use our who is. Mailing list discussions are on the public policy mailing list at ppml.aaron.net. If you're not a subscriber, I recommend that you do become a subscriber. Elections. Uh, this time of year is when we have elections. We have one open seat for the address council of the ASO, 
Anyone that is an attendee of NANOG may vote on Tuesday, October 19th until 5 p.m. There's an uh, on-site uh, voting booth. I'll say that again. Anyone, NANOG 32, can vote for this person. And uh, Aaron Board Advisory Council, there's two open seats on the Board of Trustees, five open seats on the Advisory Council, and the voting is open to Aaron General Members in good standing only. So you have to be a member in good standing to vote. So this is one of those important reasons why if your organization is not a member of Aaron, that maybe you should think about becoming a member of Aaron because you can vote for these two very important bodies. The AC election, the incumbent is Eric Decker. His term expires at the end of this year. The term is for three years. It will begin on January 1st. Um, the uh, candidates' bios are at that ASO uh, uh, URL. The NANOG procedures for voting, you can vote online at that URL. The polls will open at 9 o'clock in the morning and will close at 5 o'clock in the morning. Your only eligibility is that you have to be a registered attendee of NANOG 32. And all we need from you is your first name, last name, and the email address that you use for your NANOG 32 registration. Remember, it's the address that was used for your NANOG 32 registration, not necessarily the one that you like. So make sure you know which, what that address is. So your participation, your involvement is the key. I've said that several times throughout the course of uh, this afternoon. Go to Aaron's website. Go to the public policy mailing list. Uh, announcements are sent out on the Aaron announce list. Go to the NRO website. And if you haven't done so, go to the WISIS website. So time if you haven't done so register now for Aaron 14 if you're a general member in general good standing the $150 fee is waived and the registration services help desk is open on site during Aaron 14 as I said earlier participation this week uh, Monday night 9 o'clock is an Aaron boff this is where you get your opportunity to tell Aaron what you want this has nothing to do with making policy or anything else like that these are things that you think Aaron should be doing and you don't have to be a member of Aaron to do that. Tuesday from 9 to 5 is voting for the ASOAC. Tuesday at 5 p.m. is a tutorial on Aaron's certificate authority. And so uh, we have implemented this and people are starting to use it. And Tuesday at 6 p.m. is a policy proposal box. Now this is really a good opportunity. If you've got a proposal but you're kind of afraid to stick it up on the website, you can go to this box. And you can throw it out there and see what people think about it. So you only have 10 people, 50, maybe 50 people in a room that are going to say something nasty to you as opposed to several hundred people on the mail list. So it's actually a good chance for you to put it out there and see what the reaction really is going to be. And also, you probably are going to get some good ideas about how to make it just that little bit better, make it uh, that much better for, for the rest of the people. Because you're bringing to that policy proposal at the start is your perspective. And here's your chance to interact with people and, and get some other perspectives into that proposal. And uh, so if you haven't done so, please register and attend Aaron 14. Contact information, there's the uh, help desk. And during the days, Monday through Friday, it's open from uh, 7 to 7. We have a billing help desk. We're the only IR that has one. So if your accountants are having problems, they don't have to talk to IP analysts. They can talk to other accountants and uh, work out the bills. You can send email to our hostmaster system, and uh, we have a ticketing system for tracking things. And in general, just go to our website. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. I really appreciate your attendance and uh, your attention this afternoon. And I'll open the floor up for any questions that you may have about anything I've said this afternoon. Susan. Yes. You can do it while you're sitting in the NANOG meeting and listening to a presentation. <laughs> yes, yes, during, during, during my intro talk, you can go online, okay? When Susan's up there giving her intro talk, no, you shouldn't do that, okay? Yes, please. Oh, no, you can't vote that. It, it, it'll be open. Uh, Tuesday at 9. Oh, the question was, you tried to get to the uh, voting site. 
and uh, he couldn't get there. Well, polls don't open until Tuesday. Okay, I guarantee you, if you try to go vote for President of the United States right now, that's, those polls aren't open either. So, anybody else? Ah, good question. So, uh, which uh, internet registry handles space applications and addressing extraterrestrials? Uh, well, Vint hasn't gotten around to figuring out how that should be divvied up in the first place. And so uh, I would presume that at some point in time we would have to figure out who's going to handle the address allocation for Mars. But uh, we haven't really figured it out yet how to do it for Antarctica, so let's solve that problem first. Anybody else? Okay. Again, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. Uh, please feel free to uh, talk to me anytime during the week uh, or any member of the Aaron staff or, for that matter, members of the Aaron board and the Aaron Advisor Council. Uh, there's about 20 Aaron staff here. Uh, should be about 13 or 14 members of the uh, Aaron Advisory Council and all seven of the uh, Aaron board members should be here. So we are ready and willing and able to help you and answer any questions you have. So thank you very much.